شغل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد الحمد لله Welcome everyone to another lesson regarding etika of the student and the learner based on Ibn Jama'ah's book Ibn Jama'ah's famed book on etiquettes and adab which are required for not only a student but also a teacher so the book as I've mentioned before is about etiquettes with uh, etiquettes as a student and etic- etiquettes as a teacher and it's quite interesting if you've read if you read both of the sections you'll find that a lot of the points that he mentions a lot of the advices that he gives are the same advices and they're relevant to both the student and the teacher so what's really interesting or what we need to remember is even if you become a teacher and you go on to teach inshallah it's the same qualities or those same etiquettes that you need to try and inculcate in yourself right so we began the topic of etiquettes of a student within himself and last week we were discussing intention and we spoke about intention de- in detail and we covered a couple of ahadith and in those ahadith we extrapolated approximately five or six different negative intentions intentions that we shouldn't have as students and we spoke about that at length the next adab or etiquette that you must a lot of this is gradual in steps so the next thing that we're required to do as students is to try and remove any and all obstacles that are there impeding our quest for deen quest for knowledge youth now youth isn't uh, youth isn't an obstacle to get rid of i haven't got that on the list here for that reason youth this is to say when you are in your prime and in your youth you have very little obstacles and very few responsibilities to prevent you from studying so you should try and make the most of that time and we spoke about that last week also another point we discussed very briefly was procrastination try to remove laziness putting things off i'll do this tomorrow i'll do it later if there's something to do get it done as soon as you can if if we've learned anything in this dunya it's that it will always throw something new at you if you have an assignment if you have a a bill that you have to pay if you have a problem you have to solve once you're done this dunya will not let you relax and you're not you're not going to be in a situation where you feel as though i can relax now it's all good it's all done the dunya will keep throwing things at you so if you do not deal with the issues or the problems you're facing right now and you just keep putting them off more will pile on and more will pile on and before you know it you're going to be overwhelmed by everything by all of the stress and all of the pressure <clears throat> so when you have time you should make the most of it and you should try and do whatever you can in our case try and study try and sign up to a course as we've mentioned before if you can go in person ideally you should go in person you should travel and the more you give inshallah the more you will receive another obstacle in our way when we want to study is distractions some scholars as i've mentioned before regarding travel and some some of you might be asking why is it necessary to travel why do we always hear this point about traveling first of all 
it's necessary to travel because the scholars, some of the greatest scholars in the world, they're not going to be at your doorstep, right? So studying with them, ideally you should try and aim to study with the most God-fearing, the most knowledgeable, not for other reasons, and we'll speak about that hopefully next week, inshallah. But to be able to study with them, you need to travel, right? Also, traveling broadens your horizons. It also opens your mind. If you have always stayed in the same place for your whole life and you've only ever met one kind of Muslim, you're going to have a bit of a culture shock when you travel out of that town or out of that city maybe even a different area in that city, you're going to be really shocked with the way people are, right? Not everyone's a Muslim, and even if they are Muslim, not everyone follows the same madhab. If you've been in an area where you are, you're surrounded by ahnaf, for example, and you go to an area and, and you've not educated yourself or sat with anyone to seek knowledge regarding these matters and you go to an area where there's Shawafia, for example, or some Maliki brothers and they're praying a different way. SubhanAllah, a lot of people get shocked. So it's important to travel to understand that people are different, they have different ways to appreciate that, to be more understanding. This also primes you and prepares prepares you in the role of a teacher and if you wanted to become a mufti, right? Because in that case, you are able to contextualize people's questions and understand that this is the context they come from, this is the background, and these are all things that might change or affect the fatwa. So distractions, you need to travel. For you to remove distractions, traveling, because when you're close by, you have too many commitments. Now, it's very important to remember that you're not running away from commitments. You shouldn't be running away from responsibilities. The issue is that if you're around friends and family all of the time, that's going to be a problem or a distraction in you studying. But the pursuit of ilm should not become an excuse to rid yourself of responsibilities. This is the other extreme that you find with many students. They're not so, they're not so serious about studying as opposed to they just want to get away, right? If you have responsibilities, then you need to work around them. If your, your responsibilities require you to be around, then you have to be around and make other arrangements. If you have people who rely on you, you have to fulfill those rights. This is based on the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, wherein he said, Kullukum ra'in. <coughs> the Prophet wasallam said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyyatihi. And this hadith is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. It's a sahih hadith. Right. What you find is when, when scholars are talking about studying and traveling and going away, some of their comments might seem a little extreme. But what you need to understand is you need to contextualize it with all of the other the other the other rules and regulations and requirements and fara'id and your responsibilities which Islam has placed on you. Right, so if you have them all of all of those together in mind, then you can understand what the scholar is referring to when he speaks about, or when he has comments that seem to be a little extreme. Why do I mention that? This next point is very relevant here: marriage. Right now, listen to this example or this quote from a scholar from the Salaf al-Salihun from the early generation. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimullah, rahimullah ta'ala said, 
whoever marries has embarked upon the sea. Right? Whoever marries has embarked upon the sea. He's off on a journey. Then if a child is born to him, he has been shipwrecked. SubhanAllah. Right? If a child is born to him, he has been shipwrecked. I've come across some shuruhat uh, or, or commentaries uh, saying that the attribution of this statement to Sufya and the Thawri seems a little dubious because many scholars don't agree with this. So this quote may seem a bit extreme. Whoever marries has embarked upon the sea. Then if a child is born to him, he has been shipwrecked. The point of this quote, number one is to give you the importance of ilm, right? And it's not to bring down marriage. Why? Because marriage is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as he said, nikah min sunnati, wa kama qala alayhi salatu wasallam. And the next part is not actually part of the hadith, but in the marriage khutab, uh, people usually add add it to that hadith. They usually say, nikah min sunnati, faman raghiba an sunnati, falaysa minni. <coughs> Excuse me. Those are actually two separate hadith. It should be qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an nikah min sunnati wa qala alayhi salatu wa sallam faman raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. But the point is still valid. Nikah is from my sunnah. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And then he said in another hadith faman raghiba an sunnati whoever turns away from my sunnah falaysa minni. He's not from among me. You should not stay away from marriage, right? Because it helps you. It not only helps you, it helps the husband, it helps the wife. Both of them receive much benefit from being married. Worldly benefit, ukhrawi benefit, the dini benefit, right? And so to avoid marriage, you lose those benefits. Also, the other benefit is you protect yourself, inshallah, from sin. Now, if there are certain individuals who want to focus on ilm and they are not curtailing anyone's rights, whether it be family and friends or it be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rights, the hukuk Allah, the hukuk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you do not sin. So they are not curtailing any of those rights. They are pious Muslims, alhamdulillah. And the lack of marriage hasn't pushed them to sin. Then in those cases, there are certain people where it might be better for them not to get married. If you look in the books of hadith, sorry, excuse me, the books of fiqh, they will mention different ahkam for marriage. <clears throat> for some people, it would be wajib. For some people, it would be sunnah. For some people, it might be makruh. And for some people, it might be haram. For example, someone who's not going to uphold his wife's, his wife's rights, or he would end up oppressing her, it's haram for him to get married, right? So coming back to this point, Sufyan al Whoever marries has embarked upon the sea. Then if a child is born to him, he has been shipwrecked. SubhanAllah. <coughs> if there was anything you wanted to do, anyone who's married, you will realize you it's not easy to do those things. And then SubhanAllah, when you have a child, right? One child, even if it's just one child, you have multiple children, SubhanAllah, it's even more difficult. But even with one child, there's so many responsibilities that you have to tend to. And subhanAllah, you could, there's no, subhanAllah, I won't say there's no way. SubhanAllah, there's a couple of students that I teach during the week at the local Dar al-Ulum. They come from outside of the city, subhanAllah. Many of them are married. They have children. They come 
uh, for a portion of the day. They come for their lessons. And then subhanAllah, they're rushing home at about 3 p.m., 3.30 to get home for, <coughs> for about 4.30. So they can prepare and then leave for madrasa again to teach kids in the evening, youngsters in the evening. Right? It's not impossible, but it's not easy. There will have to be sacrifices made. There's actually a book regarding this, people who didn't, who did not marry, scholars who did not marry. And uh, they focused, they gave preference to in of a marriage. It's actually written by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Huda. SubhanAllah, many of the books that we have been quoting in this course has, have been written by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Huda. SubhanAllah, that's because he, he is that kind of scholar. He was very focused on etiquette and adab and usul and, and, and principles, uh, subhanAllah. So this book is called Al-Ulama Al-Uzzab Al-Ladheena Aatharu Al-Ilma Ala Al-Zawaj. As we mentioned before, this is relevant to some people, uh, but not other people. So marriage might be necessary for some, for others, it could be a, a preference, it could be a, a, a good act, but not a necessary one for them. The next point regarding Adab of a student within himself is that he must be content with a little. <clears throat> it has never been the way of the scholars to be rich. Okay? If that is your idea, your idea is to study so you can make money, you can go around the world and give talks, whether you want to be Mufti Menk and travel the world and subhanAllah have so many different courses and everyone subhanAllah wants to invite you or someone like Sister Yasmin Mugahid and you want to become famous and a lot of money this it subhanallah if it if it does well for you in the dunya it will never do well for you in the akhirah as we've mentioned before it's an intention that will cause your downfall allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us you're going to have little food you have to make do with the little food that you have this is not in every case, but this is generally the case. You also also have to have few clothes. Now, when I say this, do not get scared. This does not mean you have to starve or dress bad. The point is you do not focus on these aspects. You don't focus on the food <clears throat> and you do not focus on <coughs> your clothes. So there was a companion who when he heard about pride, he felt, he, he misunderstood. He thought pride was looking after yourself and trying to uh, appear to be good in your, in your dress sense, right? So he asked the Prophet Wasallam about that. And the Prophet Wasallam responded, Inna Allah jamilun yuhibul jamal. Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. Right, so when you dress, dress well, but it can't all be about the dress, it can't all be about the garments and the fact that they have to be designer. This is not the way of a scholar. SubhanAllah, my teacher, Sheikh Muhammad Adam Luna, Hafidahullah told us of his time in, in, in when he was studying in his seminary 
he would have two thobes, right? Just two. <clears throat> Nowadays, subhanAllah, majority of people, at least five, six. And if you have five, six, people will laugh at you and say, what, are you poor? Right, you've only got five, six. We have, I mean, the sisters will have multiple um, jalabiyas or jabbas or um, thobes. And another problem we have is we always like to give preference or give focus to matching. We are, my clothes need to be matching and, and I, I'm not going to go out if anything is slightly off. So my teacher, he used to have two thobes. Sometimes he'd only have one, and he told us what he used to do, subhanAllah. Now, this was in India, in Deoband, right? And there was a lot of poverty there. When I tell you these stories, it doesn't mean that you have to live this way here, and, and from tomorrow, you have to throw all of your clothes out, because you need to be aware of your social standing or how life is here right, as opposed to India or Pakistan in certain rural areas, uh, you, you, that's understandable. It's a level of poverty, but you don't force poverty on yourself. But the point is you don't complain when times are rough or you don't have enough, right? So I tell you this story in hopes that we appreciate what we have and we don't complain and focus too much on, on I don't have the right thawb, I don't have the right qameez, or the right jalabiya, or the right jabba, right? Or the right abaya, things like that. So he, sometimes he would only have one, and what he told us he would do, when those days that he only had one, he would wash it before sleeping and leave it out to dry while he slept, and then wear it again in the morning, subhanAllah. And this was... As you know, India, Pakistan, it gets quite hot. And by the morning, it would be completely dry. And if you, you're probably thinking, SubhanAllah, Sheikh, you're going to class in, in, in clothes that are creased. A lot of these scholars, they do not think twice about their appearance. Right? You see some of them, hat is like this, or, you know, um, Someone has to constantly remind them, like, um, uh, Sheikh, um, so, you know, your coat, let me sort your coat out, let me sort your scarf out, Sheikh, because they don't have time to think about that. They've, they've got about a hundred constant, constantly they have at least a hundred questions buzzing around in their mind. A fatwa that someone asked them and, you know, uh, a concept of ijtihad that uh, uh, needs to be addressed or piyas about something. Right? They're always thinking about these things. And if not that, then taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing that they're thinking about is their clothes. So a little crease, subhanAllah, for us, if we're a bit, my, my, my thobe is a little crease than I'd like, I, I'm, I can't go, I can't go today. I can't go out, out today, subhanAllah. So this is what we need to avoid, giving too much focus uh, on your clothes, too much focus on your on your food. So the true, pers true, true pursuit of knowledge has never been a path of riches, at least not in the beginning. This is very important. You might cite some examples of certain scholars who were very rich or certain companions who became rich. What, we're, what we say is generally it's not been the way of riches, the path of riches, and especially in the beginning, this was not the path of riches. So Muhammad, during the time of the uh, Abbasid Caliphate. Scholars were told if you can translate a book on Greek philosophy from Greek into Arabic, then you shall have as reward the weight of that book in gold. So there was a time where scholars, subhanAllah, were starting to get paid. But um, subhanAllah, in, in general, it's ne not really been the case. In the beginning, it wasn't the case. Now, it certainly isn't the case. Unfortunately, now, scholars don't demand, well, generally, 
God-fearing scholars do not demand money, but they do appreciate the ability or they appreciate not having to resort to other people or not having to rely on anyone else to be able to do their work. So what ends up happening nowadays is scholars, they have to resort to other jobs so that um, they, can, they can teach the dean, but at the same time they can earn a living. And it becomes problematic because those who are teaching the dean and serving the dean, they have to sacrifice that time to go and work. So the scholars who demand or ask for riches, majority of them who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <clears throat> not the exceptional, not the exceptions, majority of them require just enough so that they don't have to rely on anyone else. But subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his sunnah was the way of poverty, right? And seeking knowledge, becoming a teacher, becoming a student is not a guaranteed path to riches. The Prophet ﷺ chose poverty over kingship and riches when he was asked whether he wanted to be a prophet king or a prophet slave. He, <coughs> he chose slavehood. Imam Shafi'i rahimullah ta'ala said, no one ever seeks this knowledge and is successful in it with wealth and authority. However, the one who seeks it by humbling himself, having little wealth and serving the scholars, he is successful. Right? So this is the quote from Imam Shafi'i about chasing wealth and authority which you might have realized if you see a scholar who does chase wealth and authority, subhanAllah, Allah has put this natural understanding in our hearts that we kind of turn away from such people, right? So that was content with a little, being content with a little. Another, if anyone has any questions or wants to make a comment, or want some clarification on something, you can send the message on the chat. You could put it public, or you could send it to me personally. My account on here is ask questions, or ask question. Right? So value of time, another very important etiquette you must try to focus on when or before you study. You need to understand when the best times to study are. Now, this is not referring to formal study at a seminary or at an organization or online, <clears throat> right? So I'm going to mention to you the best times to study what I don't want is you going back to your teacher or your madrasa or your dal ulum and say to them, excuse me, can you change the time, please? Because we were told this is the best time to study. If you've already been informed at your institute of a time to study, then you're really supposed to be studying at that time. However, this is personal study or when you have the freedom to be able to ask uh, scholars, if you can sit down with them. So the first thing you need to do is you make a timetable and you fix times for specific things. Some scholars even list the best times for different activities, right? If you look in Ibn Jama'ah's book, he does that in his book. So he'll mention for the mornings, this is best, for the afternoons, this is best, for the evenings, this is best. And he'll say studying, memorization, research, writing, all of these things he has specific times, but what is generally mentioned by majority of scholars is early mornings. And this is the time wherein we have a lot of barakah. Anyone who is used to waking up early in the morning and realizing how much they are able to do can testify to this fact, 
right? And this, subhanAllah, is based on the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Allahumma barik li ummati fi, fi bukuriha. <coughs> oh Allah, bless the mornings of my ummah. Related by Imam Tirmidhi. So it's the best time to memorize and research. Personally, when I, when I start early, I'm, I'm not saying I always wake up early, right? Uh, but subhanAllah, the times I wake up early, it's amazing how many hours of work you're able to do. But if I start my work past 9 a.m., subhanAllah, I struggle to even get a single hour or two of work done. So best times to study. Figure out what the best times to study are. Mornings primarily. Best places to study. Where should you be studying? I always have this perfect picture in my mind, picturesque image in my mind of sitting on a mountain in the background. SubhanAllah, the sun is about to set and you're sitting there with a group, with your teacher and there's a river close by and trees are around. I'm probably evoking a lot of feelings of SubhanAllah, wow, that would be absolutely amazing. According to scholars, that's quite the opposite, right? Because all of these things are distractions from now, you can appreciate those things as in they are the wonders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation and you should appreciate them in its time. When you are studying, you're supposed to focus on the study. So scholars will say in a plain room, study in a plain and empty room with few distractions. Even posters, you shouldn't have posters or calligraphy. So Allah, even calligraphy, right? Look around in your room, everyone right now. Uh, what do you see? that's distracting you, subhanAllah, right? I had this habit as, as, uh, from when I began studying Arabic, whenever I saw some calligraphy on the wall, I always wanted to sit and I'd, I'd be sitting there, okay, why is this? Why is it marfu' here? Why is it, why is it like this? Why is there no aliflam here or this tanween and so on? And I'd try to try and figure it out. If you're studying and there's a beautiful calligraphy piece right in front of you, it's, it's probably going to distract you. So try and study in an empty room. So like I said, we'd love to study around nature. We'd love to study around beautiful things. It sounds perfect, right? But you'll be continuously looking around, right? Look at that river, subhanAllah, look at those birds, right? subhanAllah, look at the uh, mountains. So best places to study, the places where you're going to be, where you're going to have fewer distractions. <clears throat> On this point of value of time, there's a very important book, again, subhanAllah, written by <coughs> Sheikh Abdul Fattah Hudda. It's called Qimat al-Zaman Inda al-Ulama, The Value of Time. It's actually translated in English too. So you can write, read it in Arabic. You can search for this and find it anywhere online. Pima to Zaman Angel Ulama. Or you can buy it in English, The Value of Time, an amazing book, subhanAllah, just to kind of appreciate what the scholars went through and the, the sacrifices they made while they were studying. Right. Minimal food is the next etiquette that a person, a student has to inculcate in his life. This is a general rule for everyone, right? Not only students of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu, eat and drink, but do not be extravagant. So it's not just for students. This is for everyone, but especially students, right? The more you eat, the more lazy you're going to feel. Or in Ibn Jamal says, the more you eat, the more thirsty you're going to feel, the, get the more, th the more you drink, that's going to make you feel lethargic and lazy. So try and be moderate in how you eat. 
also, subhanAllah, the food needs to be halal. There's a hadith wherein the Prophet ﷺ describes someone whose dua is not accepted, right? But he, he bears all of the hallmarks of a person whose dua should be accepted. But then the Prophet ﷺ mentions, فَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامُ وَغِذَأُهُ حَرَامُ وَهُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامُ Sorry. A number of things he says. He had everything he has, his clothes, what he's been nourished with, his food, all of that is from haram. And then the Prophet ﷺ asks a question, فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لِذَلِكَ How can such a person's dua ever be accepted? So it needs to be lawful, the food needs to be halal. The food, small amounts, just enough to keep you from being hungry. SubhanAllah, Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala said, I have not been satiated for 16 years, SubhanAllah. Eating a lot, right, is, has never been, not only has it never been the sign of a student or a Muslim, Ibn Jama'ah says, rahimahullah, that This is obviously up, up until now, up until very recently. No one has ever been praised for their eating. I say that now because, subhanAllah, you have, uh, you have a lot of like YouTube videos or internet, social media stars who they have this as a profession. See how much they can eat, subhanAllah. They have these competitions. But Ibn Jama'ah, yeah, Alhamdulillah, Ibn Jama'ah is not here around today to see. I think he lose his mind. So no one has ever been praised for how they can eat, right? Eating, number one cause of sickness or excessive eating is the number one cause of many sicknesses. Just the hassle of, subhanAllah, just the hassle of constantly needing to use the, the lavatory should make us desist from eating too much. There's a hadith mentioned in Tirmidhi wherein the Prophet ﷺ said, man has not filled a more damaging vessel than his stomach. A few morsels should suffice <clears throat> for man to keep his back straight, man as in man or a woman. If he must eat more, then a third of his stomach should be for food, a third for his drink, and a third to breathe. Right, so the Prophet wasallam said a few morsels, right? And if you feel like you have to eat more than a third for drink, a third for food, and a third to breathe, right? This is mentioned in Tirmidhi, but what do we do, subhanAllah, eat so much that you do not even have the capacity to be able to burp, subhanAllah, we're not supposed to burp in front of people anyway, but there literally is no room for air for you to be able to even, uh, subhanAllah, Allah save us from this kind of behavior. Inshallah, we've got a couple points left on this section. <coughs> Excuse me. A good diet, a higher path, sleep and rest and socializing. And then inshallah, we will, that will be the section about the etiquette of the students come to an end. And أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. If anyone has any questions, you you can feel free to ask or you can mention on the group. Have the scholars mentioned guidance caution about eating takeaway food not prepared in one's home? Subhanallah. Yes. I was actually speaking to a non-Muslim today, right? So get this. I was speaking to a non-Muslim today who says, I don't eat from takeaways and restaurants anymore. And I asked him why. And he said, well, I have a house that I rent out. I rent this house out. And the family that have been using my house, they have a restaurant. They're chefs and they have a restaurant. And they've lived in my house for a year and they've just moved out. 
And once they moved out, I, I, moved, I went back in to try and prep the house for the next tenant. And he says it was absolutely disgusting. The walls, the countertops in the kitchen, the, the carpet, right? And so he says to me, and the, these are famous, known owners of a restaurant or a takeaway. And just based on that, subhanAllah, he decided not to go to takeaways and restaurants anymore. <clears throat> Why do I mention that? Because there are scholars, not only scholars, there are Muslims, non-scholar Muslims, who are so concerned and worried about their food. And we're not even talking about halal and haram. SubhanAllah, we don't need to get into that conversation, right? There's plenty of uh, online debates and fights going on about who's halal, who's haram. Whatever. We're not even talking about that. But the level of taqwa of certain scholars and certain people is that I do not want to eat from anyone who has not prayed their five times salah, subhanAllah. I know certain people who will tell me I do not buy normal clothes from the shop or normal trainers from the shop. I have a tailor. I will buy the cloth and my tailor, subhanAllah, he prays five times a day. So I will get him to make my clothes. What we don't realize is everything has an effect. Like we said in that hadith, right? If, if the food you ate from a takeaway or a restaurant was made whilst the person was angry and swearing his head off, for example, or it was during Maghrib time and he thought, forget it, I'm not going to pray. What kind of effect is that going to have on the food and what kind of effect is that going to have on us? Right? Now, yes, you're, you're going to be thinking, subhanAllah, but there's only so much you can control. You can't be the master of everything and determine what's going on behind closed doors. And it would be wrong for you to try and seek that out. Of course, that's why scholars will generally say, if you can determine that food is halal, then it's permitted for you to eat there. It's not a problem. But some people, what they enforce on themselves, right? On themselves and their own families, the requirement, the taqwa requirement, subhanAllah, it's an ideal that very few can reach. But yeah, subhanAllah, so many people, many people are very particular about where they eat. If music is playing, they will not eat there. They will not eat there. If there's free mixing going on, they will absolutely not eat there. Okay, Jazakumullah khairan for today's dust. A question on the point of marriage and its relevant rulings depending on one's individual and circumstances. A point was made on a person not marrying from Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghadda. We missed it. May the point be repeated, please. Right, okay. Uh, so there was a quote. That what I mentioned was, first of all, the quote was not from Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda. The quote was from Sufyan al according to some people. And that quote was, whoever marries has embarked upon the sea. He's gone on a journey. Then if a child is born to him, he has been shipwrecked, right? Now, what that basically means is, once, once you get married, you're on a journey. And when you have a child, there's no going back. Do not have, you know, subhanAllah, a lot of people, subhanAllah, a, 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 a lot of people get married and then have kids and have fantasies about returning back to their life. And, and they see, na'udhu billah, their kids as you spoil my life, subhanAllah, billah, they... If it's a woman or a man, I've, since, I've, since, uh, since we've had you, I don't get to exercise much anymore and I feel uh, so tired all the time. And they have this fantasy of returning back to life as they were when they were a youth. It's never going to happen. And it's a very selfish feeling to have. We've lived our lives. Now, subhanAllah, it's about prepping the next generation. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And we can't be so selfish all the time, right? That uh, more about me, right? And it, it, it's very difficult for a selfish person to be an effective parent. So 
Uh, Sufyan al-Thawri said, whoever marries has embarked upon the sea, then if a child is born to him, he has been shipwrecked. And then I mentioned that, uh, I mentioned a book about scholars. So uh, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda has mentioned, uh, he has, he's written a book uh, collecting names of scholars who did not marry because they gave preference to knowledge. And the name of that book is Al-Ulama Al-Uzzab Al-Ladina Atharu Al-Ilma Ala Zawaj Al-Ulama Al-Uzzab Al-Ladina Atharu Al-Ilma Ala Zawaj That's the name of that book. So, yeah, if you need me to repeat that again, inshallah, I can do. Not a question, but dear one, Zindabad, subhanAllah, mashallah. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, SubhanAllah, wherever the scholars of taqwa are, Zindabad to all those places, mashallah. Could you please recommend some revision tips, especially when revising hadith? Would it be best to write them all out or to go over them? Revision techniques, tips for hadith. The most effective way I found although I still struggle, so maybe I'm not the best suited to be giving this advice. But the best way i found is to constantly use them. I am not the best with my memory in terms of a hadith or names of scholars or books, but what I've realized is in my day-to-day -day work, I use those names of those scholars or the names of those scholars or books quite often and intuitively you begin to remember them another thing you could do is put them on little post-its and maybe post them in a respectful way put them uh, stick them around places where you're going to be studying the more you look at them when you wake up in the morning when you sit at your desk and you see it the constant reminder <coughs> excuse me you will remember them inshallah I don't think you have to keep writing. Well, so it might work for some people, uh, constantly writing them out. I've, 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 I haven't had the best results with like rote memorization, but so maybe if you do group memorization, right? So you ask for someone to ask you questions and give you prompts and maybe that might be effective, right? But yeah, constantly try to use them, uh, advise people about them, tell people about them. That would probably be the best way, that would probably be the best way that I've, I've, I've noticed. Any other questions? There's a couple of minutes left, inshallah. So inshallah, once we finish this section about etiquettes of a student within himself, inshallah, we'll go on to etiquette of a student within with his teachers, <clears throat> right? And uh, this is not for me, right? I have to disclaimer, I have to mention this. This is not to say, make sure you do all of these things with me. And I want you every day to be in this way and when I reprimand you, I want you to, Sohana, right? This is, um, Sohana, we're going through these notes together so that when you go on to the, the main topics of Ulum, inshallah, you know how not to offend a true scholar, right? How to be patient with a true scholar, how to be thankful to a true scholar and how to gain the, the most you can. Any tips on note-taking whilst reading the book so that one may remember the points and reflections taken on? Oh, yes, of course, yes, subhanAllah. Likewise for us whilst attending the... Uh, yes, yeah, subhanAllah. So, note-taking, there's actually a point mentioned by Ibn Jama'ah, and... So, <laughs> 
Uh, we'll talk about that when the time comes about note taking. But one thing you absolutely, absolutely should do is uh, on the on the front of your book or at the back of your book, there's usually a page or two which is completely blank. Those pages need to be absolutely filled, number one. <clears throat> because how many times do we read something or hear something and then you think, subhanAllah, that's an amazing gem. And then a couple of weeks down the line, we want to remember it and subhanAllah, we, we, we have no idea where we read it. Right, and that's happened to me so many times that I kind of got sick of it, so Honda. And I thought to myself, "That's it. I'm going to do something about it." And so what I did was, I would write on the inside, you know, a, a line or two, or maybe a couple of words, which would describe the point that I've just read, and then the page number. On top of that, when we are studying. Uh, you can, if there's a space in the margin, then subhanAllah, you know, tip, tips. Sometimes uh, the, a scholar might mention a point, but there's no <coughs> verse of the Quran or hadith mentioned regarding it. SubhanAllah, when you start to, when you've studied one book and then you go, you go through other books in, this, in, in the same field, Right, and and you notice something extra, you can jot that down in your book, or you could jot down verses of the Quran or on the same topic or a hadith on the same topic. But the the most important one, without a doubt, is at the front of your book. Make sure you absolutely, absolutely have a a list of references. Right, this is what I found. The writing in the last few pages is just done in pen or pencil. It's it's up to totally up to you. So I mean, um, some scholars will say make sure you use a pen so that the pencil doesn't. Obviously, over time, the lead, uh, it, it, the, the the markings of the writing of the pencil might run out. I personally prefer pencil, just because it's. I so I, f I feel like my writing is better with a pencil. If I write with a pen, I feel a bit embarrassed by it. So so I personally just do it with a pencil. That way, if you make a mistake, you can rub it out. And um, yeah, but absolutely, the, you, you absolutely have to do that. When I was studying with my teachers, I've in, in, in a lot of my books, for example, we studied Hidayah or Muhtas al Quduri or Aqidah Tahawiya. My books are absolutely filled the back, the end of quotes that. Ustad has given us on a certain topic, a hadith that he mentioned to us, and then I'll go back and re double check, uh, reference, uh, cross reference it with the hadith and, and, and write it down. Right? So these are all things you could possibly do, inshallah. Hope it is of benefit to you. Right? I think we'll end there, inshallah, and carry on next week. Jazakumullah khair, everyone, and uh, make dua for me, please. May Allah bless you all. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.